This ain't your mama's, Jim Sterling. It's your mama, Jim Sterling. <gasps> Oh, you know, it's been such a rollicking week, such a rollicker, that we don't even have time to talk about them changing some camera angles so you can't see Miranda's arse in the Mass Effect re-releases. Uh, we had this argument. It's always the asses. It's always the asses that, that cause the trouble. If only, if, if only people cared as much about the abuse in the game industry as much as they care about asses. I'm an arse, and they don't care about me. So before we crack on with two Royster Toyster stories, Royster Toyster? Before we crack on, look, I'm not gonna start every episode talking about my non-binary finery. Uh, Lord knows the gym position isn't a place where I repeat myself. But you know, I wanna throw in little answers to questions here and there. Um, one of the biggies is pronouns. Um, we'll get through this quickly. Uh, as I said in a video before, I use they and them instead of he, him, she, her. Um, some people have been confused about it being um, like a plural. Uh, no, it's, it's got a singular use. I've been using it singularly for years. You know, here's an example. Someone sent me a letter today. I don't know who sent it, but they let me know there aren't enough ass shots in the gym position. I do want to thank so many of you uh, to whom all this is new and you're trying to like learn and, and accept all the stuff. That's awesome. Uh, as far as the pronouns go, I know that there is that confusion, but most of you are gamers. You can understand Metal Gear Solid. Some of you even know half the plot to Kingdom Hearts. You'll ace pronouns. And then we'll get on to the Neo pronouns. I'm trying to free your mind, Neo, but I can only show you the door. Stadia? More like Stadia? <laughs> Am I right? After launching to the fanfare of literally Google and the cynical disinterest of everybody else, Google's highly publicised but lowly regarded video game streaming service has coughed up its first bit of blood less than a year after launch. Now look, I'm not saying the streaming technology isn't impressive, but absolutely everything else about Stadia is shit. I and many other pundits are literally said before its launch that nobody could guarantee whether Google Stadia would be around in a year's time, and while it's still limping along, the fact its very owner has scaled back support for the thing pretty much signals this experiment has failed. Technically, things are not over for Stadia, but let's face it, the thing was catatonic on arrival, and the latest blow won't pump life into it anytime soon. So yeah, Google itself, the Google part of Google Stadia, is shutting down its Stadia development studios. That's Google of Google.com and Google Mail and Google Stadia, shutting down development for the Google Stadia, a Google product that Google operates and used to develop for but doesn't anymore because Google won't make Google games for Google Stadia. Dot com. The service will still stream games for those third-party companies who deign to support it, but the support isn't coming from inside the house. Not anymore. Now, Google's failure to develop games for its own platform is the exact same thing that cut Stadia's legs out from under it since the very first day. Google has almost zero understanding of the many markets it tries to encroach upon. Creating best-in-class games from the ground up takes many years and significant investment and the cost is going up exponentially, stated Phil Harrison, an experienced veteran of failed companies and projects. Given our focus on building the proven technology of Stadia as well as deepening our business partnerships, we've decided that we will not be investing further in bringing exclusive content from our internal development team and SG&E beyond any near-term planned games. Oh, that voice was particularly obnoxious today. Both Google's Montreal and LA-based studios will be shutting down. Basically, video game development needs more money and time than Google thought. Which tracks 
because Google pretty much doesn't understand a goddamn fucking thing outside of selling targeted ads for Nazi black metal and harvesting the data of miners. This is also not the first time a corporation with zero game development insight thought making them was easy and that high-end top quality games could be churned out cheaply and quickly. Such examples include Amazon, Apple and of course Bethesda. Google demonstrated a complete lack of understanding from the outset, unable to guarantee whether we'd be able to keep our game purchases in perpetuity on a streaming-only service. Google kept assuring us to simply trust them, to simply have faith that if we dropped $60 for the mere right to stream a game, the historically controlling and exploitative game industry wouldn't use it as an excuse to fuck us. Still, Google practiced the naive faith it preached, since it assumed ISPs would back Google Stadia up and suddenly out of the goodness of their hearts stop throttling all of our connections in support of our game streaming efforts. That by the way is when I knew Stadia was doomed and Google didn't know what the fuck it was doing. Back in July of 2019 when Phil I should know fucking better Harrison said America's pathetically restrictive data caps weren't a concern for a service that does nothing but stream vast quantities of data. Harrison legit claimed that ISPs have a strong history of staying ahead of consumer trends. He legitimately said, I shit you not. ISPs are smart. They understand that they're in the business of keeping customers happy and keeping customers with them for a long time. Fucking hell, the only reason we're with them for a long time is because they've carved the fucking country up into their own fiefdoms. Yes, Phil, everything I touch turns to Ash Harrison there. Claiming Google Stadia is worth buying because Comcast would suddenly stop being complete fucking garbage when half a dozen people want to stream Metro Exodus. ISPs actually have a strong history of keeping broadband speeds at three mbps, a six year long stagnation. They also constantly urge for the destruction of net neutrality so they can instate more caps and throttles, and they fought tooth and nail to stop competitive services like Google Fiber coming to more territories. Yes, Google Fiber. Google from Google.com. This company literally knows ISPs fight against improvements, against service upgrades, against customers being happy. And yet Google thought these companies would just improve their services without a single incentive out of the goodness of their heart or because they think it's good business sense to not piss everyone off even though that's all they do. That is ridiculous. That is naive absurdity. This is also the company that tried to win some indie games over to the Stadia side but couldn't offer them any money or any exposure or really any reason to waste their goddamn time with it. Stadia continues to exist but Nintendo once told us the DS wasn't replacing the Game Boy and that the 3DS wasn't replacing the DS and that the Switch wasn't replacing the 3DS. Technically true, but in terms of practical support and signaling the life and longevity of the platform to a wider industry, it's a death blow. Not only does this end Google's ability to produce its own exclusives, well, it never had the ability, I guess. It sends the message to other prospective developers that Stadia is a dead end, that its own platform holder isn't bothering to support it anymore. Hello PS Vita. By shutting down two studios with barely any software output, it also communicates clearly just how unqualified for the game industry Google is. Stadia looks set to eventually wind up in the Google graveyard, like many of us predicted, the ever-growing list of things Google has created and then killed. It currently stands with a death toll of 224, 19 bits of hardware, 35 apps, and 170 services, all released by Google, all shut down, often around a year later. It's what Google does. It barrels in, flings as much shit at the wall as possible, and damns the consequences. And that attitude was supposed to build a fucking gaming platform. Grandma always said, a salad a day will keep the tax man away. I'm not sure what that really means, but we all love a good salad. But no one wants to be cutting with a knife all day. Grandma's got arthritis, she can't be doing that. My name is Ronnie Neville, and this is the ultimate Irish prep. 
take a cucumber, one, two, three, carrots go just as easy. A bit of an onion, no more tears. The only tears you'll have are tears of joy. You say tomato, I say tomato, you say tomato, and there he is in seconds, your salad done. The bowl can pivot, it's such a great tomato. Add that in for a final tomato. Have a look at this, guys. Americans and Irish, we have something in common. We love bananas. Bananas. I'm not sure what that really means. Grandma taught me that. She knows all the tricks. If you order right now, watch what I'm going to do for you. Don't miss out. Don't miss out. Your family will remember. Patenting game mechanics is bad. Patenting game mechanics is bad. Patenting game mechanics. Hey, it's bad, friends. Warner Brothers Interactive, Bucket of Bath Scum, has been trying and failing to patent the critically acclaimed Nemesis system as seen in Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War. It's a good thing that Warner Brothers Interactive has failed to patent this system, and that is because patenting game mechanics is bad. Unfortunately, after many failures to stop other people building on a creative idea, the Warner Corp finally holds exclusive ownership of something a comparatively small game studio invented. This is bad, because patenting game mechanics is bad. I'll tell you why. Especially because there are some The Gamers out there who have been celebrating this and cheering for Warner Brothers. What the fuck is wrong with you, you corpo cooks? If you've not played the Shadow games, the Nemesis system is thus. You face a hierarchy of orcs, each with their own names, personas, looks and characteristics generated procedurally. As you fight them, your relationship with them changes. An orc that kills you will grow stronger, right down to no-name fodder enemies who will become promoted off the back of your loss. They will recall previous interactions and in some cases players will end up forging their own personal personalized arch enemy. It's a fucking cool system, even though they deliberately cheapened it in the sequel to sell loot boxes to such a degree that even closing down the market can't stop it feeling like a lesser version of the original. Anyway, that's more or less what WB has claimed ownership of, using Rube Goldberg language to justify it, of course. Basically, a hierarchy of enemies that are generated randomly and will remember what the player does. That is what no other game developer can do now, because patenting game mechanics is bad. Now, there may still be those of you who are wondering what exactly is the problem here. After all, we copyright a lot of fiction. Why not have rights for something you, or rather the people you don't pay enough, invented? Well, here's the immediate problem with that. Outside of the Nemesis system, the Shadow games pretty much lift the gameplay wholesale from everything else. The level traversal and stealth simply is Assassin's Creed, while the combat system simply is Rocksteady's system from the Batman Arkham games. Which has Warner Brothers games, Warner Brothers could have the rights to that, that combat system, except they couldn't because patenting game mechanics is bad. In any case, it's undeniable that the Shadow games takes pretty much all of its gameplay from elsewhere. And that's fine. That's simply the case. And the games are, well, the first game was very, very good, and the second one was, was an absolute insult. Monolith happily used all those systems from other games without a second thought, because that's the game industry. It's iterative, it shares ideas, and while that can lead to stagnation and too much copying, it's also kind of necessary when it comes to art. It's necessary when it comes to everything. If everyone patented a way of doing something the first time they did it, do you know how fucking wild that would be? If every single thing that was created could not be done by anyone else, it would make cyberpunk look like Muppet fucking babies. The dynasties that would form? An entire family that holds the secret of the car mechanics. One single gigantic company that makes windows and 
just Windows, because legally it can only create the one thing Winston Window invented decades before. And it has to license out glass production, of course, because of the glass syndicate of old London Town. That, my friends, is a recipe for a corpo-controlled economic system even worse than the one we have. Now look, theoretically, only I could have come up with this thing, the pus-filled and god-hating chunky grumbler, but theoretically, anyone could use the techniques I used to create it, and let's face it, a fucking chimp could draw this stupid thing. Though if it did, I would sue the chimp. Because this is mine. And look, we only all know how to draw because we're all allowed to do it. Nobody has the rights to use a pencil or Photoshop or to take a photograph. The photo belongs to you. Only you were stood there at that moment, at that angle, to take a photo uniquely and truly yours. But the idea of taking a photo? We need that to take photos. Similarly, you need to be able to use game systems to make game systems happen. Ubisoft made dozens of shitty open world games so Monolith could take that idea and make a better one with Shadow of Mordor. We needed the original Rogue to innovate a style of play that now dominates the higher end indie game market. And while corporations wish they could hold exclusive rights to mechanics that they would then get to license at a prohibitive cost, their usual short-sighted avarice renders them unable to see the downside that the money they'd make charging for an idea would be overwhelmed by the cost of paying for everyone else's. And here, my babies, is the problem, because they ain't gonna do that. The only reason so many companies stay in the game industry is because games aren't too expensive for them to make, no matter what their defenders tell you. Bobby Kotick isn't in the games game because he's losing fucking money. He's sure as shit not in this business because he loves or likes video games. None of them are. You think Activision, EA, Ubisoft, Take-Two, Warner Brothers itself wouldn't be out of here as soon as they start having to pay to throw a punch? Games simply wouldn't get made. Corporations would be too cheap to license the mechanics and indie studios wouldn't exist. They just wouldn't. They wouldn't be able to afford to. Especially the ones that do come up with their original ideas that a corporation would then steal and defend in court to the bankruptcy of the indie. You know, like these hack fucks do. It's very funny that Warner Brothers patented a game mechanic when it's got no problem ripping off other people. Ooh, nobody owns memes, we can steal those. You couldn't, could you, you fucks? There's no Angry Birds without Crush the Castle, no Guitar Hero without Guitar Freaks, no Streets of Rage without Final Fight. To draw a legendary example for this, the reason we went decades without seeing anything playable on a loading screen and still don't today, the reason loading screens were are always so boring. You want to know that? In 1998, Namco Bandai patented the idea of gameplay and loading screens. The patent expired in 2015, but we didn't see really any loading screen mini games since then, did we? Because even though the patent expired, we lost 17 years of iteration, of fucking doing anything with it. Namco just sat on it, didn't actually put more minigames into their loading screens. They just wanted the idea, literally so nobody else could have it. And nobody else did, and we saw nothing. These days, of course, developers are far more focused on making loading screens shorter, so short you can't even see tutorials, let alone play something. But my god, something playable on a loading screen could have saved Anthem's launch day. 17 years of creative death. I can only imagine what kind of weird, interesting, fun things could have happened on loading screens in that 17 years. How less bored so many of us would have been for almost two decades. And who knows? Maybe some of those minigames could have been spun off into their own thing by now. There are, there are all sorts of weird ideas that people build upon and turn into something else, something new, something bigger. And, and, and if you're not allowed the basic idea, you can't grow your art form. Patents were conceived to promote innovation, I'm told. 
But like everything in this fucking system, it's exploited and manipulated to enrich the underhanded. We all know about patent and trademark trolls, right? No-name outfits patent a broad and often vaguely defined idea for the express purpose of suing people. It doesn't get much attention because it's boring and it's happened for such a long time, but Sony, Microsoft and Nintendo are almost always in court because someone had the idea for a controller that they didn't even make. Then we get rotten hat fuckfaces like Tim Langdell somehow managing to trademark the word edge and doing nothing inventive at all, just waiting for games and magazines to use the word so he can sue them. That's not innovation. That's literally the exact opposite. And the system seems entirely geared for the benefit of giant corporations, those with huge legal teams, or severely duplicitous dickheads. Companies get away with copying all sorts of shit, but heaven forfend anyone even look at theirs. The patent system is broken beyond belief, or working as intended for the benefit of a select few, but let's not talk about capitalism again, eh? Lord, he knows that Jim Sterling subreddit doesn't need another semi-annual post about how Jim's output lately really isn't very good, which everyone then chimes in on. Oh yeah, I'll write for a pretty awesome video about ADHD and nothing. I'll grow actual fucking tits and nary a peep. But of course I regular post about how I suck and have gone off the rails. Oh, they all come out of the woodwork. It's fine. I don't have severe ego problems. It's fine. Patenting cane mechanics is bad, but if I could patent the way I do my work so others couldn't copy it and become about ten times more successful doing so, well, this Girls gotta get what they're fucking owed somehow. It's fine, I don't have severe ego problems, it's fine. Is it a monster? Is it a monster? And now it's time for that feature we run every single week and have done for years. It's time for an update in how I'm getting on with Monster Hunter, a series I never used to like, get out of my mouth, but now really like. Let's see how I'm getting on this week. It is very, very sad to know that some people are cheering Warner Brothers Interactive for this. Um, by far, one of the most censorous and creatively suppressing moves you can do as a company. But you know, well done Warner Brothers for securing the rights to something that you didn't create. You didn't create it, did you? So, you know. Anyway, that's enough of all that jizz. I'm tired and bored now. Oh, also Laura Kate Dale, a friend of the show and author, um, who did an ass book, actually, so, you know, on theme for the intro, um, did tell me that, like, the moment I identified these tits as feminine in any way, I couldn't get them out. So, YouTube being both progressive and restrictive there, so, thank God for me! Maybe another 2,000 subscribers lost today. Tits! Absolutely fantastic. Americans and Irish, we have something in common. We love bananas. You can slice them up in no tomato. 